office and the AHD is here with us. And this is an important event on empowering youth for sustainable development. And as you know, we are meeting here uh, as we meet here for the high level uh, political forum this year. Thank you again for joining us and ASG uh, Paulier. I thank you and your team uh, for your partnership and collaboration. I'm also very, very pleased to see, see here the large presence of our youth representatives from all around the world. Uh, again, a warm welcome and thank you for being here with us. I'm also very pleased to see our partners here from the UN family. Uh, dear friends, uh, for the three groups of countries that my office supports, uh, the least developed countries, the landlocked developing countries, and the small island developing states, this is especially a critical time. Together, these three groups of countries make up 92 of the most vulnerable countries in the world, and they are bearing the heaviest brunt of the ongoing multiple and overlapping global crises. Yet these countries also present tremendous opportunities because they are blessed with a huge youth population. The international community adopted the 10-year Doha program of action for the LDCs last year. The Antigua and Barbuda agenda for the SIDS was also adopted a few weeks ago in May. And later this year, we will adopt a new program of action for the landlocked developing countries. So as you can see, all these three groups of countries have their new development contexts, their new programs of actions. And all these programs of actions recognize the potentials of the youth population for, it, for achieving their development goals. And as we begin implementing these three new programs of action and embark on a decade-long development journey, it is imperative to ensure that the youth are fully integrated in this process to achieve the goals set forth in these three programs of actions and the 2030 agenda. Because without a doubt, we all recognize that youth are powerful agents to drive the sustainable development agenda in these 92 most vulnerable countries of the world. Dear friends, and some of you were there at the LDC uh, 5 conference last year in Doha, we witnessed firsthand the profound impact of youth voices. And I'm very pleased that some of you who were there in Doha are with us today. Young advocates there, our young youth representatives there, presented innovative solutions to pressing issues faced by LDCs, ranging from climate change to economic instability. The youth declaration that was adopted in Doha reflected the young people's vision for a better future and their commitment to delivering on its promises. Similarly, in May, end of May, when we met at the SIDS core conference, the youth again ensured that the Antigua and Barbuda agenda for the SIDS, that is a new program of action for the small island developing states, included a clear emphasis on their role in driving forward the SIDS agenda. And looking ahead now to the third United Nations Conference on the Land of Developing Countries, the LNDC3, which will be held in Habaron, uh, Habarone, uh, Botswana in December. We will also be again bringing together our youth representatives in a LLDC Youth Forum. And we believe that will be a critical platform uh, for the young people from the landlocked developing countries to influence the policies and strategies that will shape their future. And also to let you know that this is the first time that the Landlocked Developing Countries Conference, this once in a decade conference, will be held in Africa. And it does make sense because half of the LNDCs are in Africa. And I'm very pleased to see uh, some members of the LNDC3 Youth Advisory Group also here with us today. Um, the advisory group has been very active over the past year or so, and they have already put together a youth declaration for the LNDCs, uh, which we expect to be endorsed and presented at the uh, Botswana meeting in December. And this, uh, this declaration, the youth declaration, embodies the vision, priorities, and recommendations from uh, our youth. And uh, I believe it will be a very, it will be a significant contribution to the discussions and decisions uh, that will be taking place in uh, in Botswana. I would like to thank you for your hard work, and I will, I count on you as vital partners in making that conference, that very important conference, uh, especially the youth forum, uh, a success. Uh, today's platform, dear friends, will serve as a platform. Uh, uh, today's event will serve as a platform to share knowledge 
exchange ideas and collaborate to amplify the impact of youth-led innovations on the 2030 agenda. And very, very importantly, the implementation of the respective programs of actions of the least developed countries, the land of developing countries, and the small island developing states. It's very, very important. These three program of programs of actions are very closely aligned uh, to the to the goals and targets of of the 2030 agenda, but even goes beyond uh, that. And uh, I'm pleased to see that you'll be exploring critical areas uh, where youth are making significant in, in, uh, impacts, such as on socioeconomic development and debt, ICT and digital innovation, and environment and climate change. Uh, allow me uh, now to share a few thoughts uh, on these three overarching areas. First, on socioeconomic development and debt. The evidence is there. A young population brings uh, numerous opportunities for economic growth and innovation. However, however, the LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS suffer from high levels of public debt that limit government investment in critical areas, including including in quality education and employment opportunities that are so critical uh, for the future of young people and impacting them even now. So certainly we need innovative financial solutions and international support to alleviate the crippling debt burden on vulnerable nations. And I hope that today's discussion will also come up with some very specific recommendations and ideas in this regard. Secondly, on ICT and digital innovation, Digital technologies can bridge divides, promote inclusive economic growth, and foster innovation and entrepreneurship among young people. And youth are the driving force in ICT implementation and playing a crucial role in harnessing these technologies to create new opportunities and solutions. Yet, yet, as we all know, the LDCs, LLDCs, and SIDS lack access to reliable internet and digital technologies hindering their ability to participate in the global digital economy. There's a huge gap in terms of access, in terms of affordability, and I think that's the digital gap that we need to certainly uh, address. So enhancing ICT infrastructure and providing digital literacy, I would say also access infrastructure, I hope we make more equitable access to ICT technologies, and providing digital uh, literacy programs will be a critical element to accelerating SDGs and achieving the development aspirations of the next generation, as well as of these countries. Finally, uh, on environment and climate change, young people all over the world will inherit, will inherit the impacts of the present climate crisis. Their future depends on the decisions made today on climate change. If we fail to reverse the current climate catastrophes, the youth of today will be disproportionately affected, threatening their livelihoods and future. So it is no surprise that young people are among the fiercest voice uh, when it comes to climate change. And I would like to tell you that my office stands with you and will continue to support you and to advocate for robust climate adaptation and mitigation strategies for the meaningful involvement of youth in environmental and climate change discourse globally. And again, I would like to see some very concrete recommendations and ideas coming out from your discussion here today. Let me, let me end uh, by reiterating the critical importance of young people's contributions and participation in shaping the sustainable development agenda in the least developed countries, the land of developing countries and the small island developing countries, 92 countries, in other words, half of the UN membership, a large person, billions of people globally across the world. Your energy, dear colleagues, dear friends, your energy, your creativity, and your determination are the driving forces behind the positive change that we seek. And we are so very pleased now that we have an ASG is dedicated to lead you, uh, lead your, uh, bring your voice, to the global discourse, to the center of our global discourse, and anything that we are discussing, whether it is hard core issues on climate change, finances, debt, and everything. So again, uh, thank you for your dedication, passion, and unwavering commitment. And thank you once again for joining us. Thank you once again, uh, ASG, for being here with us, for your partnership. And I look forward to a very fruitful discussion here today. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Over to you, Yuki. 
Thank you so much, USG, for your very powerful statement and highlighting the importance of youth. This is really an, a timely time for, for us LADC preparations, but also SITS and LDC youth. Now, I would like to uh, hand over the floor to our Assistant Secretary General for Youth Affairs for the United Nations Youth Office. Uh, Mr. Philippe Ollier, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Shuki, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, depending on from where uh, every of you is joining today. Um, dear young people present today, thank you for your interest and for dedicating time to be in this discussion. Uh, dear Under Secretary General Rabab Fatima and colleagues of, of her team and other UN partners present today, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation for our United Nations Youth Office to join, to support and to collaborate together with you and to partner on this initiative. It is, it is a pleasure for me to join you today for this high-level political forum side event that is putting a focus on the pivotal role of young people uh, in driving sustainable development. Um, thank you to, to the Office of the High Representative for the least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states. For, for the invitation and for the initiative to address uh, today uh, about your challenges and, and also to discuss and to, and to reinforce the ongoing leadership uh, in prioritizing the voices of young people uh, from the most vulnerable states. It is my pleasure to, to be speaking to you today as, as the first Assistant Secretary General for Youth Affairs at the United Nations, uh, and very excited about the challenges that implied this step forward in the agenda of the Youth Affairs in the United Nations. I, I took this responsibility and I assumed my mandate last December, um, and I believe that we are at an opportunity to take the United Nations work with and for youth to the next level. And while in my case, I'm relatively new to this organization, the UN's work on youth spans back many decades. For years, young people have been calling for a seat at the table. So our office job uh, is not to represent the voices of the youth. Our office role is to help to ensure that more young people are meaningfully included in decision-making spaces and that all the youth voices and perspectives are heard. It is not about youth representation. It is about youth participation. As I am sure you have experience in your own advocacy work as young leaders, Young people are extremely diverse, and each of you brings different intersectional perspectives to the challenges that our world is facing. And young people are beautifully diverse. This is especially true in the least developed countries, in the landlocked developing countries, and in small island developing states, where young people make up a significant majority of the population. The world today is home to 1.9 billion young people. This is the largest generation ever of young people. Half of the world's population, 50% is under 30 years old. And many of them, almost 90%, live in developing countries. Unfortunately, young people remain almost invisible in policy making and in decision making processes, as well as in the positions of power. Less than 3% of members of parliament worldwide are aged under 30, 
and this is even less when we speak about young women. Young people's exclusion from these processes undermines the valuable contributions they bring for the good of all people and for the good of people today and for the good of future generations. This is why a major focus of our team's work at the United Nations Youth Office is to promote more meaningful, effective and diverse youth engagement in all aspects of public life. Everyone has a right to participate in public affairs, but we see that many times all over the world, there are social, economic, financial and legal barriers that prevent young people from meaningfully participate. We are working to address those barriers and we are working to ensure that more young people are represented in decision making spaces at every level. Echoing the demands of young people as heard during the ECOSOC Youth Forum this year in April, the Sustainable Development Goals Summit in 2023, and other prior intergovernmental engagements, it is time to move to action and to put meaningful youth engagement in practice. This year, the United Nations is leading a very crucial intergovernmental process. The upcoming Summit of the Future, which will take place this September, is a once in a generation opportunity to rethink our multilateral systems. And we need to take these principles in mind. Over the past, our office has been working together with young people around the world to advocate for concrete commitments at the summit of the future in the hopes of making meaningful youth engagement the norm rather than the exception. We need designated spaces and structures for that engagement to take place and for that engagement to take place based on the principles of inclusion, accessibility, diversity, and transparency. And we need it to be backed by dedicated resourcing everywhere around the world. Let's be clear and let's reflect together. Involving young people in these processes isn't just about appeasing them. It is about making decision-making more effective and it is about building greater trust in multilateral and in public institutions. It is particularly encouraging to see young people's contributions being prioritized in the recent LDC 5 and SITS 4 conferences, as well as in the preparations for the upcoming LLDC 3. And it will be equally important to ensure young people's active engagement in the follow up, in the implementation, and in the review of these important programs of action. Our office is committed to continue working together with you in advocating for the voices of young people from the most vulnerable states to be included in decision-making processes at all levels. So I wish you a productive discussion. And as I said at the beginning, thank you for letting us, for giving your time to be here, to discuss together and to have a fruitful conversation in the diversity that this space represents. Thank you, Juki. Thank you so much. I would like to hand over the floor directly to Tembi uh, because we will be using uh, some time to then start the next section. Thank you so much for the opening statements. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Yuki, and uh, thank you once again to uh, USG Fatima and ASG Poly A4 joining us to set the stage for these very important conversations. I know uh, USG Fatima has to excuse us and because she has another engagement soon. Uh, thank you, USG. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. So we're going to move over to our youth participants. Uh, we're going to be hearing from youth speakers who are doing very powerful, innovative um, actions from their countries. We have youth from LDCs, LDCs and SEEDS who are going to be talking about three very important topics um, that have already been flagged by our USG, which is socioeconomic challenges, ICT and digital innovation, 
and environment and climate change. So for the first topic on uh, socioeconomic challenges, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Irina Stapit from Nepal. Irina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Um, hi and namaste everyone. My name is Irina Stapit. I am from Nepal. And today I will be talking Uh, Irina, I think you're on mute. Perfect, there you go. Okay. Um, hello and namaste everyone. Uh, my name is Irina Stapit and I am from Nepal. Today I will be sharing some of the um, challenges that youth face in terms of STEM. STEM refers to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And um, yeah, so um, youth in Nepal and South Asian countries uh, face significant challenges in accessing STEM education due to intertwined issues of poverty, lack of education, and gender disparity. These obstacles create a complex environment that hinders the growth of young minds and perpetuates cycles of inequality and underdevelopment. The first one is poverty. Poverty is a predominant barrier. Many families in these regions live below the poverty line, struggling to meet the basic needs. This economic hardship forces children to contribute to household income rather than go to schools, uh, which causes um, dropout rates. And limited financial resources also mean that schools often lack the necessary infrastructures, equipments, and trained teachers to provide quality STEM education. And one of the most concerning outcomes of this challenge is the phenomena known as brain drain, uh, where talented individuals leave their home countries, driven by the pursuit of better economic prospects and opportunities abroad, leaving their home countries. The second one is lack of education. Um, the lack of education further exacerbates the problem. Many rural areas in Nepal and other South Asian countries, they suffer from inadequate educational facilities. Uh, schools, if available, are often underfunded and overcrowded, and the curriculas are outdated and do not keep in pace with the modern scientific technological advancements. Teacher training is often insufficient, which leaves educators ill-equipped to inspire and guide students in STEM shop subjects. Uh, moreover, the emphasis on rot learning over critical thinking and problem-solving skills often stifles the creativity and innovation among students. The third one is gender disparity, and this is very close to me because uh, gender disparity adds another level of complexity where cultural norms and societal expectations often prioritize boys' education over girls. Those who do attend school often face bias and discouragement in pursuing STEM subjects. These cultural mindset leads to a significant underrepresentation of women in STEM fields, depriving the sector of diverse perspectives and talents. The underrepresentation of women, especially in leadership roles and academia, creates what is often known as the leaky pipeline, where talented women drop out at various stages of their careers. And addressing these challenges require a multifaceted approach. Of course, the governments and the NGOs, they must invest in education, education infrastructure, provide scholarships, and implement policies that promote gender equality in education. Community awareness programs can help shift cultural attitudes, encouraging families to support their daughter's education. Additionally, targeting interventions such as mentorship programs, female role models in STEM, and hands-on workshop can inspire and empower the next generation of youth scientists and engineers in um, Nepal or other South Asian countries, and not just South Asian countries, I think this problem can be seen in uh, can be seen worldwide. Um, so yeah, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for giving me this platform.
thank you, um, Irina, for your uh, presentation. And I'll hand over to um, our second speaker, Yanko Juma, who is from Malawi. Yanko, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Yanko Happiness Juma uh, from Malawi. I work with My Finance Limited, a microfinance company that provides uh, credit to women and the youth who are doing various um, entrepreneurial activities. I am really honored to present My Finance today and uh, to be part of this huge platform with also like-minded uh, people. As a credit officer, I have witnessed uh, first-hand transformative impact of access to finance and social economic development. In our country, Malawi, we um, believe in that women and the youth are the backbone of our economy, and the SMEs is the engine of the growth. However, we face numerous challenges, including limited, to, uh, limited access to credit, which hinders the, the, our ability to grow and thrive as youth. This is where my finance limited comes in. We believe that affordable American loans can be a powerful tool for socioeconomic development. In our experience as a company, we have experienced that uh, when women and youth have access to credit as capital, it is um, they're able to invest in their businesses as well as create uh, job opportunities, improve their overall well-being and of their families, invest in education and uh, healthy care. However, we are not immune to the challenges posed by national economic and uh, debt constraints. As a company, we have implemented strategies that mitigate this risk. That's including credit scoring and risk assessment, ensuring responsible lending, financial literacy to our clients, flexible repayment at partnerships with other organizations that help in providing uh, support to our clients. At My Finance Limited, we are committed to supporting the next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs. We believe that um, empowering women and the youth in SMEs we are not only trying to drive socioeconomic development, but at the same time, we are also trying to create a future for our youth. But speaking from a youth perspective, access to finance is very critical uh, for education and employment opportunities. When young people have access to capital, they can invest in their education and entrepreneurial activities, leading to a better future for our youth and their communities. Our youth face a wide range of challenges when it comes to credit and that also hinder their development and potential. High unemployment and underemployment leave many young people struggling to find meaningful and adequately compensated work. This is compounded by a stark mismatch between the skills that they acquire from different institutions, maybe universities or vocational trainings that they do, um, and by the demand that is um, that is compensated by today's rapidly evolving job market. And also the debt burden by the least developed countries such as Malawi has far reaching consequences for the opportunities and future prospects of the youth. The world of debt limits government spending on essential services such as education and health care, as well as uh, creating job opportunities for the youth and women, resulting in uh, reduced access to these fundamental rights. Economic inequalities continues to widen, creating disparities in access and essential resources and the communities. Technological advancements were well offering great promise, but also contributes to the digital divide as it affects other people who have inadequate access to the tools and the skills they need. The burden of debt, both personal and national, weighs heavily on young shoulders. Personal debt, such as student loans, constrain their ability to invest in their futures. National debt, often leading to austerity measures, reduces public investment in critical areas, such as job creation and education. Low literacy levels, it's a very intimidating, it's a very intimidating barrier. Limiting educational attainment and economic participation. Without literacy, the ability of the youth to navigate through today's economy is severely compromised. The loss of employment opportunities further compounds these issues, reducing economic growth and worsening social issues. To address these challenges, we must embrace innovation solutions and foster sustainable growth and social well-being. Firstly, we need to transform our approach to education and skills development. 
expanding vocation training and internships and promoting digital literacy and STEAM education. We hope to keep these young people with the practical and future-oriented skills they need to succeed. But also encouraging entrepreneurship and innovation is a very crucial tool that we can use to provide support for startups and creating innovation hubs that can empower young entrepreneurs to turn their ideas into thriving business, generating employment and economic growth. Community and youth engagement should also be a priority in trying to solve some of these challenges. Leadership and civic engagement programs can empower young people to take active roles in the community and the broader society. Volunteer and service programs can also foster social cohesion and provide viable experiences. In the global arena, we must mobilize international support, such as in assisting variable countries in managing their socioeconomic difficulties, such as Malawi, while investing in youth development. Financial assistance and debt relief can ease immediate pressures that free up resources for long-term investment in education and youth services. These international partnerships can enhance local education systems and provide technical training in a critical sectors like healthcare and technology, and also supporting entrepreneurship and innovation through global funds and business networks can stimulate economic growth and open new opportunities for our youth. Policy, policy advocacy and governance support can promote transparency and effectiveness in public services, creating environment con conducive to youth development. Across border collaboration through regional integration and global youth programs can also foster economic opportunities and mutual understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenges facing the youth today is very, very immense but we can beat these challenges by working together, embracing innovation and mobilizing international support. We can create a future where every young person has the opportunity to thrive. The youth of today are the leaders, innovators and change takers of tomorrow. Let us commit ourselves in securing their future and in doing so, ensure the progress of prosperity and global community. I would like to conclude in my today's presentation by saying the debt burden of least developed countries requires urgent attention to ensure youth have access to opportunities and resources necessary for their growth and development. Innovative financial solutions and international support can help to ease this burden and promote sustained economic growth, empowering youth to become agents of change in the different countries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ianko. And um, at this point, I would like to hand it over to Ellen Taylor from ITU, who will be moderating the next uh, topic on ICT and digital innovation for inclusive growth. The floor is yours, Ellen. Thank you very much, Tembi, and thank you to Irina and Yenko for those really fantastic and engaging remarks. Um, it's really my honor to moderate this uh, small panel discussion on digital innovation and inclusive growth and information communication technologies, or ICTs, in LLDCs. So this is a very important topic for us to bring to this forum today, as youth are key stakeholders in digital development. Uh, globally, 79% of youth use the internet compared to 65% of the rest of the population. So what does this tell us? This tells us that youth are leading in digital spaces and that they have expertise that needs to be recognized and engaged meaningfully in decision-making spaces about our collective digital future. And I have the distinct honor of uh, being able to chat with three youth entrepreneurs today who are doing just that, who are leveraging technology and innovation uh, in digital solutions in LLDCs. So today I have the honor of uh, introducing Mr. Muketsi Benedict, a youth entrepreneur from Botswana, uh, Ms. Zainabu Bogayoko, a youth entrepreneur from Mali, and Mr. Siraz Nupan, a youth entrepreneur from Nepal. Welcome everyone. Uh, Siraz, I see you on my screen first, so perhaps I can start with you and ask you to please share some highlights on the transformative potential of ICTs and digital innovation in your work. The floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, Sala, just continue speaking, or you'll be asking follow-up question. Uh, Feel free to chat, okay. and I'll, I'll ask you. questions. Thank you so too. Much. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you so much. So thank you so much, Ellen, once again. Hello and namaste, everyone. So let me start by saying a quote. Uh, so the power of technology is in its ability to bridge the gaps that divides us. So uh, my name is Suraj Neupane. I'm from Nepal. I'm a youth engineer and entrepreneur representing the Vertex Special Technology, an IT company from Nepal. Today, I want to share you uh, all a story of innovation, resilience, and hope from my homeland. In Nepal, agriculture is the backbone of our country. According to 2022 National uh, Sample Census of Agriculture, 67% of our population is engaged in agriculture. However, this vital se uh, sector faces numerous challenges like food loss, food waste, and food safety throughout the supply chain, both pre-harvest and post-harvest. For example, the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Livestock Development in 2023 revealed that post-harvest losses in paddy, maize, wheat, and millet, just these four crops amount to staggering 111 million US dollars. For fruits and vegetables, the losses are even more drastic, ranging from 10 to 15% in tomatoes and as high as 70% loss in potatoes. These losses, losses not only affect the economy, but also the livelihood of millions of farmers who depend on agriculture. At Vertex Special Technology, we have taken on the challenge of addressing these issues throughout uh, through innovative technological solution. So let me share a success story that shows the transformative power of information technology and digital innovation. In a remote village in Nepal, Farmers struggled with pest infections that destroyed their uh, crops annually. Traditional methods of pest control were uh, ineffective and accessing expert advice was nearly impossible due to geographical barriers. Our AI-powered plant disease detection application provided a lifeline. Farmers would simply take a picture of their affected plant's leaf and the app would instantly diagnose the problem that uh, suggests and suggest remedies. This not only saved their crops, but also improved their yield, significantly boosting their income. Apart from, the, apart from this, we are also working on multiple innovations. We are integrating IoT sensors at various stages of the supply chain to collect data and monitor condition. We are also exploring the use of blockchain technology to ensure traceability and transparency, thereby reducing the issues of middlemen who often are responsible for increased cost of the product and depriving farmers of their fair income. Our ultimate goal is to create agriculture information management system to address the gaps and challenges in Nepal's agriculture food system. However, to scale up these innovations and benefit more youth, we need strong policy and regulatory support. Government should create framework that incentivizes technology adaptation. For instance, regulation that provides grants and subsidies for technological innovations can significantly reduce the financial burden on the startups and encourage more youth to venture into this field. Furthermore, private and pri uh, public sector partnership and collaboration with stakeholders are crucial as well. These partnerships can facilitate knowledge sharing, funding, capacity building, and policy advocacy. Uh, by working together, we can create a, a ecosystem that supports innovation and entrepreneurship, enabling youth people to drive positive changes in their communities, promoting and adopting technology in the way forward, however, this requires infrastructure development, digital literacy, capacity building, research and development, and most importantly, proper investment. Government, international organizations, and private sector all have a role to play in this endeavor. In conclusion, uh, let's remember that uh, let's remember that the future lies in our hands. By leveraging technology, we can overcome the challenges we faced and create a more inclusive and prosperous world for us all. Together, let's harness the power of information technology and digital uh, innovations to drive sustainable growth and development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Siraz. That was really well said. And you spoke about a lot of key, key issues when we talk about youth and digital innovation. I loved uh, the reference to food waste and uh, infrastructure development, uh, as well as digital literacy, really like key foundational elements of your work and uh, of, of youth engaging in this digital space. Thank you so much.
I'd now love to uh, hand the floor over to Zainabu uh, to share a bit about her work uh, as an entrepreneur in, in digital innovation. Zainabu, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Ellen. And then uh, that was a great insight from my colleague. Good afternoon and good morning. Uh, my name is Zaina Pakayoko, and, and I'm from Mali, uh, a country located in West Africa. So we are ICOD Village. We provide digital skills and then the digital receipts. We are women and girls uh, in rural communities in Mali. And then uh, for many of you, you might know Mali is facing uh, many uncertainties and then style violence, climate change, and displacement of youth which is also increasing youth unemployment. And then we are also living in poor condition and then poverty. With ICOD Village, we provide digital schools, uh, especially we do coding boot camps with uh, youth and then young women in Mali. And then we also provide um, digital marketing and social media schools. Um, our first challenge is uh, reliable internet connectivity, giving low access to internet and then also affordability and remote area in Mali. Uh, with low distributions of light, we will barely have uh, two hours of electricity, which is also making some of our work uh, challenging with uh, internet connectivity and especially uh, having to use uh, computers. And also with um, digital uh, training and the digital skills, Mali is uh, especially in Mali, we are trying to close the digital gaps by including young women and also uh, reducing the technological disparities affecting young women and girls. As a social enterprise, we are providing um, with schools and then universities, uh, digital courses, materials with them so that young women and girls and then youth in particular can have uh, knowledge and then capacity buildings in terms of digital skills and coding to provide innovative solutions uh, in far reachable communities so that no one is left behind. For, with support with um, uh, stakeholders, we are trying to provide um, infrastructure in far and in rural communities, and then especially uh, policy advocacy from um, governments trying to provide digital skills and leadership skills uh, to the youth in Mali. With the private sector and then the partnership, we want to uh, provide internship and apprenticeship programs, especially with telecommunications companies, whereby uh, these youth that we've trained in digital skills can have internship uh, with these telecommunication companies so that um, they are also empowered and then also provide eco economic means. So I would like to include, uh, conclude by saying that um, in Africa, let us harness uh, tech talents with the youth and then uh, the young women in Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sainabu. I loved the intersectionality of your remarks there. You spoke about access in uh, to the internet and the challenges associated with that in rural and remote communities. You spoke about closing the gender digital divide, which is a really important topic. Um, and that that upskilling with digital skills and internships uh, to, to support and make sure that no one is left behind in digital development. Thank you very much. Our last uh, youth entrepreneur on the panel, it's my pleasure to pass the floor to Muketsi. Muketsi, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Ellen. Um, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm dialing out of Botswana today. The weather is, is negative, which is quite uh, not normal. You can sit in the desert, so you don't expect those. So anyway, um, so I'm, I'm a general partner at a company called Pula Space. So Pula Space was actually formed as an accident. Uh, I say an accident because, you know, uh, it was really an accident that we raised $20,000 uh, from an angel investor. And because he had trust that we could actually build a technology company that could bridge uh, the early stage funding gap in Botswana. So predominantly places like Botswana won't be known for uh, technology disruption. You only know about diamonds and so on. So. We have been able to build this platform called PulaSpace.com, which currently has over 491, uh, as of today, digital technology companies that have come from the internet. We didn't go look for them. They looked for us. We, these, these companies are by geography, 
roughly from 34, 34 plus uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they would be raising anything from $10,000 all the way to $100,000. Uh, on the other side of the company, you will find that people that call themselves angel investors, uh, venture capitalists. So these um, 101, they also come from Europe, the US and the Middle East. They have an intention to actually finance these technology companies in Africa. So now what is uniquely a secret sauce at Hula Space is that we are a magnet for young people that are sitting in their bedrooms with, with connectivity and they've kind of coded some technology solution and they would like somebody to finance it because that, that would not ordinarily be financed by a bank or ordinary type of money that you're aware of. So I mentioned the accident also just to emphasize this, that the organic growth that you see on Pula Space um, is actually every day that there's a new company coming in. And these are presumably young people between the ages of 18 to 30 years old. And they would be solving problems in agriculture, in clean tech, in financial technology, in different sectors that you can speak of, right? And what I would also like to say is these are young people who have self-taught themselves how to code. So the, the unique thing is that you wouldn't find a young person, for example, with a farm in our platform. These would be a young person who's kind of maybe created a technology that tells you that that land that you want in Rwanda or in, in Zimbabwe was used for what in the last 10 years using technology. So these are software as a service uh, technology companies. So the other wing of our company is that we've been able to strongly attract uh, venture capitalists, uh, funds of funds, you know, angel investors and family offices. These are wealthy people or who would like to invest in Africa who see this as an asset class. Lastly, we've also been successful in telling the stories um, that there are young people who are doing it. I'll give you an example. We have recently signed a company that has um, been able to turn a mobile phone, you know, your mobile phone into a postal office. So this company will now, is now in Kenya, they're in Rwanda, now they're coming to Botswana. They're coming to Botswana simply to take over 4 million mobile phones and con convert them into postal address. So you don't have to have a, a physical postal address. The other company is uh, called Tribase, which is based out of Nigeria, and they do peer-to-peer -peer lending. You know, people are always looking for money, but the more money sits on the phone. So a young guy in Nigeria has created a technology that allows you to do peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, without actually getting a license. So, and more importantly, let me speak to one innovation from Botswana where a young person has been able to digitize one of our tourism sites, a destination, into a mobile game that you can play on the phone. Again, an example of young people that have got the skill that they've self-taught themselves, that they've not gone to university to learn, have been able to learn how to develop a digital solution that could assist them uh, or turn into a digital business. And for every successful one business that is launched, five jobs are created. And anyone working in those companies have got a minimum qualification of a computer science degree or a data science degree. So which is the majority of the young people that are unemployed in Africa. So the skill is there, but there isn't the match in terms of bringing these talented young people into these technology businesses. Now, let me speak about the team that I work with. So I said the company was formed by accident. So I've also had to give away some shareholding of the company to a co-founder in Nigeria so that I can be able to build it because I don't have the, the full skill sets myself. My team is remote. I've got two team members that sit out of Rwanda where we are trying to say, raise together a $10 million fund, which will finance these companies. Then I've also got developers. The platform was not developed by young people in Botswana. It was developed by young people sitting in Nigeria that I've never seen with my own two eyes. So I had to transfer money and pay them without seeing them because I had to, I had to develop trust. I also overlook one team member in Kenya and in Botswana, I see a remote team of about eight guys. We don't own any office. We run our business 100% on the internet. So where does this internet come from? Again, we are backed by an angel investor. There's a wealthy individual in Botswana who had to listen to our story. He owns one of the largest telecommunications companies in Botswana. 
and he made his investment on us. He gives us connectivity. With this connectivity, we are able to use it to build companies and support other young people. Now, there's a struggle also in terms of where this talent that can build or that can see how to build these digital companies come from. So we've had to innovate and build our own spaces. So we own two inno innovation hubs in the country, which run coding programs or coded dojos, where young people that have the interest in the, uh, the, the basic foresight are able to go there, learn this basic skill of coding, or they, they have to learn software basically development, or learn the skills of the new skills of the new economy so that they can be able to innovate. So through these instruments, we are able to use these to look for talent in country, but also we've formed 28 MOUs across Africa with different innovation hubs, such that when a young person sends us their technology from Zimbabwe, from Malawi, we can instantly talk to an in-country innovation hub and, 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 and do due diligence and check if it's an actual real company. And that's, that's the, the strength of our company. And lastly, of course, there, there are challenges with this, okay? Uh, the challenge is that there's no funding for a lot of young people that I see. In my job, young people come to me every day. They look for money. They've got an innovation. Uh, and now we've started seeing young people from India. We've also started seeing young people from markets that you wouldn't think of asking us for money, right, from the UK and so on, right? Because they've got trust in what we do. So there needs to be a structured form of funding to finance young people building technology companies in Africa. So we need to make sure each country has got a tech fund, okay? A fund specifically for the new economy, technology companies. If not, you need the wealthy individuals in the, in the country to start uh, doing angel checks, right? Okay. Like in Silicon Valley. And then lastly, you also want to make sure that you tell the success stories. You know, most young people don't believe that it's possible to build a technology company and earn millions of dollars and create jobs for others. So we need to start telling stories that is possible because unless you, you, you don't follow it, people only know four, four countries in Africa that are where technology has been built. South Africa, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, and Egypt. So nobody will ever believe you that there's a young person with one million uh, followers on, their, on, a, on a mobile phone in Botswana who's built a technology using USSD and it's solving problems for the ordinary farmer. So I think the challenge is also the opportunity for uh, you know, organizations like the UN to start supporting innovation hubs with funding, but also to look at talented young people and finance them so that they're success stories. But also to be intentional to go to the countries that are not known, you know, the least developing countries, your Botswana's, your Malawi's, your Namibia's, because we talk a lot about the big four, but we don't talk a lot about the, the uh, you know, the, 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 the smaller geography. And to conclude, I mean, really young people also have to know that it, it's not, you know, it's not an overnight thing. It takes years to be built what we've done. I've been in the space for 10 years. I've failed so many times. So you're gonna fail so many times, but ultimately you find a fit and you get it right. So let me stop there and thank you so much to everybody for listening. Thank you very, very much, Mukhetsi, for sharing a bit of the, the secret sauce, as you put it, uh, in your work and uh, really uh, sharing that youth entrepreneurship from the, the ground level and the support that we need to, to foster to support youth in digital innovation. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of all of our panelists, to Zainabu and Saraz as well. Um, that concludes this small part of this session. And I have the pleasure now to hand the floor to Ms. Amy Wickham uh, from UNICEF. Amy, please go ahead. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you all for these really impactful, important statements that we're hearing thus far. My name is Amy Wickham, and I'm a program specialist with UNICEF on climate, energy, environment, and DRR. And I am very fortunate to moderate this upcoming panel where we have some young people who are going to talk to us a little bit about pressing environmental challenges, those facing vulnerable countries, including rising sea levels, extreme weather events, biodiversity loss, but also they'll highlight again some more exciting youth-led initiatives and solutions aimed at mitigating these impacts and promoting sustainable development. So we have, we are due to have three panelists with us. I see Mr. Skile um, on the line. I see Miss Naomi Cambridge also. And I'm wondering, is Mr. Kwikirza Benon, if you're here under a different uh, account, please, please let me know. I don't see you otherwise. Okay, so if 
if Mr. Quirze is not on the line, Quirze, we're going to kick off with Skele and I will hand the floor to Skele Bastos, who's an environmental activist from, from Sao Tome and Principe. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I am Skele Bastos, environmental activist in Sao Tome and Principe. I have 20 years old and I speak Portuguese. I have been environment activist since I was 16 years old and 18 I started working at Europort and it is an honor to be here to talk about the environment challenges we face. In San Tomé and Principe, sea level is a rising significant problem and I have a proposal how coastal erosion is affecting our fishing community and the Shifting cost of infrastructure where we are losing territory due to rising water level. For tomorrow, we are facing extreme wherever event such as intense storm in some period that occasions a lot of damage, such as a failing house, bridging and the more with the vast impact on our community. Social economic social social economic impact. These chances not only affect the environment, but also is have socioeconomic consequences. Our economy depends heavily on agriculture, tourism, and fishing, which are beginning to very impact by climate change, resulting in the increasing number of young people migration due to socioeconomic difficulty and the empowerment and economic empowerment. Food security is a major concern due due to the effect of climate change with rain causing destruction of crops and the drugs in some region. They are agricultural production and fishing, which are essential for live, livelihood. Youth-led initiative and solution. Despite these chances, there are many youth-led initiatives in San Tome and Principe that bring hope. For example, the youth and the straight community led by young people is promotion and the planting and the hamster campaign and the was the collection on beach and beyond to combat deforestation and protect biodiversity. We would like to invest in renewable energy. Gain and capacity bring for young people is a field to energy to help develop solution. So has community solar system that are efficient, adaptable to our local condition. As young person living in Santo Tome and Principe, we face this chanceless day. Participating in the Bat group and the youth forum has been very important for expand experience and find the collect solution to protect the environment. International cooperation and the mutual support are essential for adaptation and survival. In short, the environment translates in San Tome and Principe are increasingly notable, but with determination of young people, we are developing creative and constructive solution. And the country recently received the CPLP presidency on the topic of youth and sustainable, a very important milestone. I invite everyone present here to be supported this initiative collaborating some world a sustainable future together we can take climate change and protect our island for future generation thank you for your attention thank you skile for these powerful remarks and um, i particularly appreciate how you spoke about hope but also determination i think these are recurring themes that we're seeing through a lot of the the statements shared here this morning and really appreciate you for for sharing those and um, with that i would like to hand over to miss naomi cambridge a climate activist from barbados naomi the floor is yours thank you so much uh good morning good afternoon or good evening everyone uh as was said my name is naomi cambridge i was born and raised in barbados and i have been a youth climate activist for roughly four years now most recently, I actually had the pleasure of being on the steering committee for the Global Children and Youth Action Summit in Antigua and Barbuda that took place ahead of the SIDS4 Summit in May this year. This was a pretty groundbreaking event in which multiple youth from the three SIDS regions, well, not just three, but three SIDS regions, that being the Pacific, ACE, and the Caribbean, 
came together to collectively create a commitment to action for the future of our nations. So it's no secret that the Caribbean, along with all SIDS, face a tremendous threat when it comes to the climate crisis. The small size of our islands, limited resources, whether that's naturally or from colonization, the large amounts of debt in some cases, and the various other barriers to development make achieving resilience for our communities extremely challenging. This threat we are facing has traveled far beyond an impending status. It's now here. It's happening right now and all across my region as I speak. I'm sure that just um, uh, many of you know that just over a week ago, Hurricane Barrel hit the Caribbean with a massive force, essentially stripping countries like Grenada and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, leaving communities stranded, starving, homeless, and disconnected from the world outside their nightmare. And I hate to say this, but this is not new. My personal climate journey started with me raising money for the islands of the Bahamas who were massacred by Hurricane Dorian in 2019. And I'm sure many of you can think of other devastating weather events like this, which have hit in the past. Beyond hurricanes and storms, we feel the impacts of climate change in our everyday lives. From blistering heat to vanishing coastlines to increasing health concerns, our future as communities and especially as youth is anything but certain. The climate crisis, especially for one of the most vulnerable regions in the world, affects every aspect of our lives. Whether the changing environment endangers food security or intensifies natural disasters, which then delay or disrupt schooling, there are a multitude of, of threats that we face. In response, youth like myself and others have been increasingly advocating for action towards mitigating the causes of this crisis and increasing avenues for adaptability for our nations. So before I tell you about other youth-led initiatives, I'll first like to highlight the Ashley Lashley Foundation, which I've worked with for about three years and can probably tell you the most about beyond any other. So the Ashley Lashley Foundation and its subgroup, the HEY, which stands for Healthy and Environmentally Friendly Youth Campaign, is a youth-led and women-led organization which focuses on empowering young people to act for their future and advocates for the awareness of climate change and its impacts on public health. We've hosted many community enriching programs and events that focus on educating youth from a young age and also supporting children and youth climate activists from all over the globe to build and grow their climate resilience projects and then also connect them with relevant stakeholders so that they can improve sustainability wherever they are. The climate crisis is also known to impact genders disproportionately, which has been discussed. Organizations like the Breadfruit Collective, also known as TBC, know this. They're a gender and environmental justice NGO in Guyana, which aims to work alongside women, girls, and gender diverse people to eliminate gender-based violence by pushing policy change, aiding in self-healing, and providing leadership and training, leadership training and mutual aid support. The actions and programs created by TBC increases the opportunities for youth empowerment and encourages young people to incorporate their passions, individual experiences and interests on climate um, and gender justice. There are many other youth-led organizations across the Caribbean and beyond this. Youth have taken charge, as we know, on social media and in their schools to spread awareness on overlooked environmental concerns and stress the importance of sustainability today. Again, one event that cannot be overlooked is the SIDS Children and Youth Action Summit. The commitment to action that we created, which emerged from the collaboration of youth from the three SIDS regions, had four core pillars, those being safe and prosperous societies, resilient economies, a secure future, and environmental integrity and planetary sustainability. This event was much more than just a discussion forum. It was a catalyst for further youth involvement to ensure that our voices are integrated into global conversations. For instance, we hope that children and youth, especially youth from SIDS, play a key role in the center of excellence which emerged out of the Antigua and Barbuda agenda from SIDS4, including having meaningful input in the upcoming Summit of the Future in September. Youth from these regions must have an influence in these areas so that we may ensure that effective action is taken to achieve the goals that we outline in our commitment to action for our future. The power of youth, as we know, is indelible, and they continue to shape the nature of this crisis every day. Coming from such a small island and a vulnerable region, the actions we are taking as youth and the decisions being made globally mean everything for our future as a region and as a generation. It's why we continue the work that we do. I could talk about this issue and the power of youth for hours, however, I understandably only have five minutes, so I hope I've painted for you a picture of our fight for survival, and I hope you will act on it as if the world were fa is facing an existential crisis, because ours is. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi, for such an impactful intervention and such amazing initiatives and organizations that you shared. Um, it's so lovely to hear about you talk 
talk about the Hay campaign as well. I remember hearing about the Hay campaign back in 2020 and I've been engaging with Ashley back then and since. So it's lovely to see how it's been progressing. Um, colleagues, before I close this segment, I just want to check once more if we have Mr. Mr. Kwikirza Ben on here with us in case he's joined through a different account. OK, no problem. And um, thank you, Skile and Naomi, once again. And I'd like to hand it back to you, Yuki. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you so much also to our youth speakers. It is such an honor to hear from you from the ground. I mean, when do we have the opportunity to hear your voices in an HLPF side event where we are projecting also the views and perspectives of youth from around the world. And truly, as we have heard, we have so many youth from different corners of this world. And I love to hear your energy, your creativity and innovative solutions. But we can also see that this is all a globally connected issue. This new generation is globally connected. And I think seeing this is, is truly important, but also tell something about this new generation. I would like to further discuss these issues on youth with our panel speakers. And I would like to welcome our panel speakers, first Benson and Minji. Those are pen holders and uh, they are supported, as USG has mentioned, the drafting of the youth declaration. Uh, they are part of the LLDC3 Youth Advisory Group. We also have Jamie from OHA LLS. Uh, he is in charge of the private sector forum of LLDC3. So I'm very excited also to hear your perspective and insights from this discussion. And we have also Ellen and Amy who are moderators in this. Ellen from ITU, from the, from the youth program, from, from their side, hearing from these innovative solutions, hearing from your views and perspective is also very exciting. And lastly, we have also Amy uh, from UNICEF, and uh, I'm very excited to hear also from your insights on the climate, energy, environment, but also disaster risk perspectives. Uh, and I would like to first hand over to hear from you, Benson and Minji. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you very well. Thank you, Benson. Thank you. Um, I must say it's it's been a very exciting session. I mean, listening to the young voices and the amazing work that they are doing, um, and indeed, like everyone was sharing, that you know, youths are a very important stakeholder if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals. And each and every one of them is working towards sustainable development goals and doing amazing things. And what was cross-cutting in most of the interventions was the issue of you know, uh, financing and also the issue of policy. Uh, policy being very key, policy, getting policy makers onto the, onto the space, engaging young people in policy. Uh, and I would just want to find out from uh, the young people themselves that you know, how can we best foster you know, col collaboration between young people and policy makers um, and the various stakeholders to achieve sustainable development. I will open up to anyone who would want to share, but I heard it quite strongly um, from all the presenters, uh, and uh, I think it, it came it came also quite uh, strongly in Yanko's um, presentation. So, if anyone is willing to share with us uh, how best the young people could collaborate with policymakers and the stakeholders um, to achieve sustainable development goals. I also would like to welcome our participants to use the chat to share your views and thoughts, but I also see Mokitsi's hand. Please take the floor, Mokitsi. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I, I think it's always difficult <clears throat> when it comes from the policy perspective, okay? I say this with a different hat because I have been appointed on a government board and I oversee over 100 million Pula and Botswana, which is supposed to go to young people. So I think it needs to be the opposite. You know, I think it's about young people also leading from, from a perspective of policy, right? It, it, it shouldn't be about government saying to young people, what do, you, <laughs> what do you want? You know, young people should be the ones in a position to direct. I mean, we have seen what's just recently happened in Kenya with Gen Z. So I, I would want to take the lesson that I think the positioning is that when young people are successful, like what I've seen in Nigeria, one of their young uh, persons who has uh, built a successful billion, $2 billion companies, um, Flutterwave and Andela, uh, he's called Abuyeji, 
he's now positioned himself to set up his own fund and he's using that as a way to support fellow young people in the country right so i think it's 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 also important that you know it's not a one sided approach where government has to give to young people it's also about why young people can give back to the to the to the environment or to the country to the countries in which which they have succeeded i mean that would be my positioning in terms of how we would that if we create successful stories and successful entrepreneurs then those would naturally be able to influence the environment and the policy indeed thank you that that's very important as well you know it's it's not just about young people just asking for the government to do something for them but young people to initiate the process and be part of the process because i mean uh, like everyone was saying and also what is supported by numbers young people form the biggest demographic constituency and indeed it is from them uh, that you know mandate and issues should come from because they hold the biggest demographic uh, constituency so sometimes of course yes uh, waiting for the government might not be a solution but i think they still hold the the the, the powers and uh, they have uh, the, the the opportunities and the powers to unlock what young people want so that collaboration is very important both a push from the young people but also you know a response and engagement from uh, the policy makers yeah, I, I think I also want to to you know to hear a bit more. There's a lot that was discussed you know, about how young people are doing great work, uh, and it was really emphasised for the need to you know showcase and tell the stories of what young people are doing. Uh, I think uh, you also highlight that highlighted that uh, Benedict that you know telling the story is quite important. And if 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 you could share or anyone else would also share in terms of know how to make the the efforts of young people be more visible uh their impact that they're doing how can they be more made more visible um in advancing you know their agenda 2030 because i think showcasing them and, sh and and bringing them out is very very important but how best do you think this could be done uh within uh the ldc's LLGCs and and the seed Thank you, Benson. I see Naomi. Please go ahead, Naomi. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, so I uh, raised my hand because I felt like I could speak to that one a little bit. So one of the things that we actually did at the SIDS Children and Youth Action Summit in May um, was we connected the youth in SIDS, that, which are one of the most marginalized uh, groups of people to actual stakeholders that could help them with their projects. So they didn't only just collaborate with like speaking on the different the shared problems that they had, but they collaborated um, across regions and within their own regions to create projects that were very specific to the issues that youth face. And what they had was kind of like, if you've ever seen like um, Shark Tank or something, kind of like that, like that kind of setup where we had relevant stakeholders and people who could help fund and advise their projects. And they would do a, a little partnership pitch to them. And then they are now connected with those relevant stakeholders and people that can really fund and grow their projects beyond whether they were just in the planning phases, the initializing phases, or whether they were actually already doing these projects. And now it's not only that the people can see that young people have ideas, that's not that's not any new information. We know that young people have ideas, but now those ideas can actually be acted on, they can be actualized and can actually have the impact that they want them to. Um, and then also, I, I mean, if you just want to uh, talk about visualizing young people's uh, progress that they've been making in terms of, of solving these issues and making awareness on these issues, social media is a great platform for that because I feel like one of the things that I uh, always talk about is that the doom and gloom of everything when it comes to the climate crisis, of course, it's understandable, but it kind of eradicates hope at the same time. So when you have this feeling of everything is insurmountable and there's no good happening in terms of, of the climate crisis and um, solutions towards things, then people have a lack of hope and a lack of interest. So when you actually publicize the good that people are doing and the, the solutions that are out there that young people are actually taking part in or are innovating themselves, then it actually brings on hope for other people as well. So social media is a really great way to publicize those. And when you have even policymakers, when you have people from, like we see here in this, in this panel um, itself, having uh, UN and UNICEF and all of these different organizations come and actually take the time to highlight young people in a meaningful way, then it does it does make a difference. But I think beyond just talking, 
and actually helping them to act on the projects that they're they're working on can actually make a really big impact. Thank you, thank you very much for for that input. Indeed, social media uh, is a powerful tool, um, but also you know to partner with the young people to actually actualize and realize uh, their project. Thank you very much. I would give this to Mwinji to also continue with the discussion. Um, thank you so much, Benson and Yuki. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to each and every one of you, depending on which part of the world you're in. Um, my name is Mwenjina Chinga, as introduced by Yuki. I'm the Regional Caucus Coordinator for the Major Group for Children and Youth, as well as the plan holder um, for the Youth Declaration. Um, it's, it, it's worth noting that obviously in LDCs, youth make up 60% of, of the population. And I think when you look at the percentage that, that we have just talked about or the number, it just shows how important you know, young people are and the important role that they obviously play um, in, in attaining the SDGs. And it was just nice to listen to you know, each and every one of you um, different discussions as you just, you know, Gave um, work that that you're doing and in the Thank you, development goals. I think one thing that's so important is that it is essential that um, young people are provided with um, capacity building, so as to you know equip them with the necessary skills and resources to contribute to the realization of the. SDGs. And one question that I just had for that um, capacity of young people, the skills of young people can then be increased um, for um, youth in the LDCs. Thank you, Minji. I think um, your network is breaking a little bit, but I think the question she's posing is, if I understand correctly, how to increase the capacity for young people. Uh, I think uh, we have heard a lot of innovative stories and innovative ideas from our youth speakers, um, but I also think our discussions on this panel have also great insights on this. And um, of course, please, for our participants, I also see the chat being very, very uh, active here, um, but I also wish to pass over the floor to to Jamie. Um, maybe there are some capacity issues, also responses to these things from the private sector perspective, and I wish to hear from that and followed by Ellen and Amy from their respective perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuki, and uh, let me join the chorus of other discussants and moderators in thanking what I think were a very inspiring uh, group of excellent uh, uh, young voices. And to me, these are stories that highlight a lot of the challenges of the young people across the 92 countries covered by our office, which are LLS, which by definition, uh, development has been more difficult in. And I think this came out well when Mukutsi said in Botswana, it's a country not associated with tech innovation, but just diamonds. But to me, a lot of the stories raised are ones that are kind of distillations of hope and optimism and solutions, not just the challenges that are faced by uh, many youth in them. With that in mind, I'd like to uh, raise you know, one comment, one commitment, and one uh, question. The first the comment is that I think when we listen to these uh, youth voices, we're not just listening to the future, but also the present in many of these countries. As uh, Munji said, 60% uh, of the population of these countries are, are youth. The median age in least developed countries is just 19.7. In landlocked developing countries, it's even less, 19.5. In SIDS, it's a bit higher at 30, but these are substantially younger countries than uh, those in Europe in which median age is 44 plus. And what does this mean? This means that the majority of the populations in these countries are the youth. It means that young people can have tremendous power if they organize themselves and their voices effectively, such as, as one speaker mentioned, uh, Gen Z in Kenya recently. But also it means that youth declarations, such as that that Winji and Benson are working on, can really be articulations of both the future, but also really the present uh, too, and the policy responses needed now in these countries. 
The commitment I wanted to raise with Dan in mind is that, as Yuki mentioned, I'm leading the private sector forum at the third United Nations Conference for Landlocked Developing Countries. And as uh, ASG uh, Polya mentioned, it's not just youth representation that matters, but youth participation in such, uh, uh, in such forums. And within that, I think I'd like to commit at the private sector forum in LLDC3 to giving a platform to youth entrepreneurs, a platform for their voices to be heard, to share the great work they're doing, the solutions to the challenges they're facing. And we can do this in different ways, in, um, uh, in a platform for the voices on panels. Uh, uh, we're also looking to collect thoughts, leadership articles that can do better in more time, uh, collect the, the voices written down, the words of, of youth entrepreneurs and others such as you um, to share your, your challenges and, and how you've overcome them. And then a question related to that is then for me maybe to ask uh, you participants here, uh, how would you, as youth uh, representatives and entrepreneurs like to see your voices heard at things like the private sector forum and LLDC3, but also at other UN uh, processes more globally. And before I pass over for, for maybe um, any answers to that question, uh, let me just close by emphasizing the need, as one speaker put it, to tell the success stories, to inspire change. And as Naomi put it, to publicize the good work people are doing and solutions. Because I think I agree that it's through mobilizing action with hope that we can change things rather than just dwelling on the tremendous challenges we also face. But thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. I think I see a response from Avo. Aval, please take the floor. Hello, okay. Can, are you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you. So I think uh, from the youth practices, uh, what I noticed in Nigeria is that uh, youth have skills and innovation. They have produced a lot of successful stories. They're looking at the, how how the impact innovation is moving. So what we what they like is mentorship. So mentorship, which is very paramount to their success. So that's what I look at and. Um, I think I started an initiative called uh, Recycle 24, which which aim to develop you to give them mentorship, so that when you develop any innovation on climate change, uh, you will be able to know where to go and seek funding, the kind of materials you read that will improve your your innovation, so that you can easily get access to funding and so that uh, even to give them entrepreneurship skills because uh, there is different between somebody know how to innovate and somebody that have entrepreneurship skills so if you don't have the two so you need to maybe get somebody on the team who is good in entrepreneurship maybe you come together and join hands and then you promote your innovation so i think this is the kind of mentorship that uh, that my my initiative recycle 24 has been given and that's how we are able to even we are able to from my own community we are able to train almost 50 youths and give them necessary uh, skills that they need to push forward their innovation and which many of them have started securing funding from even local best and from even local investors and other things thank you very much Thank you very much for the intervention. And as you and also other speakers have very much highlighted, sharing knowledge, sharing mentorship, sharing leadership ideas, I think this is exactly what we need in order to move with this new generation forward and bring their voices to the platforms. And this is also not only in the private sector forum, Jamie is organizing, but also in general for the LLDC3, which I can speak for. Uh, we, we have a youth forum, we bringing youth voices to the forefront of international discussions. And this is exactly what we are working for. I'm very glad to hear how this importance is also highlighted. But I also wish to hear from our other speakers, panelists, Ellen and, and Amy, um, I wish you. I wish to also hear from from your perspective. Maybe we start with Ellen with with the ITC innovation, and we have heard a lot of solutions on that. I I, I think you have a lot to a lot of thoughts and things to share with us. Over to you, Ellen. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Yuki. And uh, thank you to everyone for this really engaging and, and insightful discussion. I could definitely talk about this for, as, as Naomi put it, for a long time. And <laughs> I will be, uh, I will try to be brief um, in order to kind of allow for a bit more discussion here. But I think there's some really wonderful points that I'd like to highlight. First, in terms of the leadership element that was just mentored mentioned um, as well as the the mentorship that's definitely integral in youth to youth leadership and mentorship as well. I'm fortunate uh, to be a youth program officer and work with youth around the world and see that firsthand um, and hear as well from youth here today. Saraz, I really loved the emphasis that you're working uh, on e-agriculture. That's a key sector in LLDCs. And um, Zainabu, the way you're really engaging with, with young women and girls in communities and making sure to close that uh, gender digital divide is, is imperative. And when we look at connecting the unconnected and leaving no one behind in our, in our digital future. Um, in terms of capacity building, I think there are um, kind of two different branches that I, I look at um, I, that I'm thinking of right now. And one of them is, is a bit more of the, the technical piece. And so we heard a lot about digital skills and self-taught. Um, a lot of youth are self-taught in digital skills, but we should be making efforts to really try and make digital skills and the, uh, and learning digital skills uh, more accessible for everyone. And uh, the ITU has innovation centers around the world that, that look to do that, as well as programming for digital skills, as we recognize that that is a really integral part of our future and our present. Um, and secondly, in terms of capacity building, I think there's also capacity building to be seen at more of the, the human level. And so in, in different programs, such as our Generation Connect Young Leadership Program in partnership with Huawei, we look at really mentoring young leaders who are doing incredible work in their community and trying to really amplify the impact of their work through human and financial resources. And so in doing so, we hope to have that more youth to youth leadership structure and really empower youth around the world in digital innovation um, as we recognize its importance in our future. And lastly, the one other thing I wanted to just mention and that we heard about it in pretty much every, every comment from our young leaders today um, was this kind of uh, call for a bit more designated structures. Um, the ASG spoke of that as well for meaningful youth engagement. And I think that's really imperative as one of the elements of meaningful youth engagement is kind of iter it's iterative. You hear from youth, but you also need to show young people how you're incorporating their feedback and ideas. And young people can then use that and go to their own communities and hopefully instill a bit of a community of empowerment. And so I want to once again thank everyone for their really lovely contributions and thoughtful uh, discussion today. And thank you very much to the team for having me. Over to you. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much for pointing out these very important things. But also, I think you highlighted well. Youth are not shy, and they will they will connect. And I'm also seeing how the how the uh, chat is being active. They're sharing contacts. They're saying they're sh sharing their thoughts. This is exactly the platform why we wish to to bring our participants to the forefront. Um, but also. We know these these topics are very international and interconnected, and one of them is is Amy's expertise area, climate change, uh, also disaster risk. We have heard from our speakers disasters are increasing in numbers and also in severity around the world. Amy, I also wish to hear from your perspective and from your expertise area as a response to these interventions we've had. Over to you, Amy. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Yuki, and, and thank you all. I I wanted to frame my response maybe in two or three areas. And I think, you know, the first one is really just to reiterate these pressing environmental challenges and how children and young people are the ones that are impacted the most. And um, I think, you know, everybody here is familiar that climate change is exacerbating the vulnerabilities of children. And that occurs for LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS intensifying their exposure to environmental challenges, threatening their well-being and their future prospects. And due to climate change, children and young people, they're exposed to risks, including environmental variability, displacement and migration and educational disruption. Um, a 2021 assessment of 6,000 school buildings in Samoa, Tongo and Vanuatu found that between 50 to 90% would be at risk um, in a strong cyclone or earthquake. 
So I know this is not news to many of you, and we've already talked a little bit about the impact, so I won't dwell on it too much. I'd just like to move into slightly more positive part of what I wanted to talk about, which is how young people are addressing the issue. And what we're seeing is that they're here, they're using their voice, they're informed, they're articulate and they're powerful, not to mention being super inspiring as well. And, you know, there's been really great examples of initiatives and organizations that have been shared already during this session. And um, I think, you know, one of the great ones that stood out for me was the call to action from the SIDS youth at the fourth international conference on Smile Island in developing states and including the demand spanning from investing in renewable energy technologies with low carbon economies to being engaged in decision making processes, as well as protection from environmental disasters and education and um, not being disrupted during emergency situations. I could go on in terms of the like fantastic initiatives and organizations, including the Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change, the SIDS Youth Aims Hub, the LDC5 Youth Engagement Group, the Caribbean Youth Environment Network, um, and that's just to name a few. But I think you know what I'd like to share with you is a little bit about what is UNICEF doing and also to challenge us and to let us know what we can and should be doing better. Um, so we are supporting young people, and that's with an aim of building resilience, protecting children's rights and empowering youth in LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS to address these challenges posed by climate change and socioeconomic factors. Last year, we adopted the 2023-2030 Sustainability and Climate Action Plan, and this sets out our plan for acceleration and commitments on this agenda for all UNICEF offices across the 190 plus countries and territories where we operate. And there's three major objectives. The first one is adapting the social services that children rely on so that they can be climate resilient in the face of these extreme events. The second is preparing and empowering children with the skills and opportunities needed in a climate change world. And then the third is on reducing emissions and advocating for the fulfillment of international agreements. So it's really walking the talk and leading by example is that third pillar that I just mentioned. But to go back to the second one, I'm preparing and empowering children and young people. What are we doing? You know, what is it that UNICEF is already doing in terms of engaging with children and young people? And it spans across multiple areas, but maybe I'll just focus in on three. And one is on child and youth empowerment, engagement and participation. So that's about involving children and young people in policy making, developing initiatives to strengthen child and youth leadership and engagement mechanisms, supporting youth led policies and programs and appointing formal youth ambassadors. And these, you know, these initiatives span from hosting youth consultations, examples such as supporting the Children and Youth Action Summit 2024 to empowering young people from SIS regions. The second I'd like to talk about is on climate resilience and advocacy, and that's collaborating with governments to advocate for children's rights in global climate fora and develop climate resilient policies. The Children's Climate Risk Index Disaster Risk Model Assessment provide a solid evidence base for such policies. And then the third is on child sensitive policies and financing. Developing and implementing policies, plans and financing strategies that prioritise children's rights, including advocating for enhanced debt relief and concessional financing. And we've recently launched the Today Tomorrow initiative, which addresses climate and disaster risk finance gaps. And I'm also I'm not sure if anyone's aware, we also have been assessing NDCs, nationally determined contributions for their child and youth sensitivity. And we have a dashboard, a platform that's online and live that's called NDCs for Every Child. And that really looks at climate policies to see how child and youth inclusive they are and looks at indicators and methodology that enables us to have information so that when we go and speak with member states and governments we are equipped with the knowledge and the information on these NDCs and what could be the gaps that may be addressed in terms of having them be enhanced for child and youth sensitivity. Um, I'll pause there because I've already said a lot and I would love to hear from the young people in this session, you know, what could we be doing better and, and what it is that you believe we could do more of? And back to you, Yuki. Thank you very much, Amy. And as we see, we have also so many initiatives, platforms, different ways to bring youth voices to the ground. And, and I think this is very, very important. And I also see and acknowledge the chat that there have been a lot of information also shared and exchanged. And I think this is something we, we should keep, keep ahead with. We are unfortunately already towards the end of this, this side event. Um, but I have to say it was a big pleasure for, for all of us to hear from the voices from around the world. 
we also had uh, our USG from OHRLS opening the statement. I have seen also ASG uh, from the youth office, the UN youth office, uh, being with us until quite towards the end. And, and I really, really appreciate that we could bring these voices to the international ground and we will continue in doing so, not only in my office, OHRLS, where we are now organizing the Landlocked Developing Countries Conference in Botswana, as USG has already mentioned, in, in, in December, towards the end of this year, where Jamie in the in the private sector forum will be bringing youth entrepreneurs. I am um, a focal point for the for the youth forum, where we will also make sure that youth from the LLDCs will be coming, but also connected to the global youth joining us in these initiatives. We have right now the HLPF going on for this week and next week. The side event is part of this, and HLPF has a lot of potential to to bring youth voices. And I think we are doing so very well, including this, this side event. Um, but in the in the future, for the for our next step forward, I think what we are taking from this is also that the youth are not shy. Youth are a are, are big next generation bringing the ideas, innovations, but also really connecting globally with, with ideas and solutions, which we should really put a spotlight on. And I hope the side event could truly do this. And I'm very, very grateful for our speakers, discussants. Thank you so much for joining us, our participants connecting from around the world. I'm very happy to see so many different nationalities represented, and uh, I hope we can continue doing so. Thank you very much for joining us. And I call with this the end of this side event, but also wishing you a great week ahead at HLPF. Thank you very much to all of you. It was a pleasure to having you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And then bye. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yukin team. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.